So now we're at the tutorial portion of the class and you're going to be making some recordings this week and doing some simple editing in the Audacity software. So let's just go through that. So first of all, you're going to be recording with your smartphone or if you have an audio recorder, you'll be using that. And where you record, if you're recording voice, where you record is very important. So you're going to want to find an acoustically dead space with no background noises. And what I mean by acoustically dead is there shouldn't be lots of hard, flat surfaces for the sound to bounce off of. And I'll demonstrate what that means in a minute. You, you want something that has irregular surfaces and, uh, and soft surfaces that are going to absorb the sound and keep it from bouncing around so that you really only get the sound that's directly going into your microphone, not all the other sounds that are caused by the sound reflecting off of things in the room. So the ideal place for you to record is in a clothes closet. So even if you don't have a closet big enough to act fully stand in, if you open the door and face the clothing and hold the audio recorder in front of you, that is going to do a lot to deaden the reflections of the sound and give you a cleaner recording. Also, it's important where you hold the device so that you get the best recording because you want to hold it relatively close to your mouth, but not too close because if you hold a microphone too close to your mouth, you get what's called a proximity effect, which emphasizes the low boomy frequencies in the sound. Here I'll demonstrate. I'm right now, I'm very close to this mic and you should be hearing the proximity effect. And as I back away from the mic, you hear a more naturalistic balance. So I'm about four to five inches away from the mic right now. And also the mic is not pointing directly into my mouth because the air that comes out of the mouth when we're speaking shouldn't hit the diaphragm of the microphone directly. If it does, it's going to create a popping sound that's very difficult to edit around. So you want to be what's called off axis, slightly off axis. You want the microphone pointing across the mouth rather than directly into the mouth or pointing sort of at your cheek rather than at the opening of the mouth. That's the way I have this set up right now is the microphone is sort of about five inches in front of me, slightly to the right of me and pointing at my right cheekbone. So the puffs of air that come out of my mouth as I'm speaking are missing the diaphragm of the mic, but it's still picking up all of the audio frequencies. Because if you take the microphone too far off axis, you're going to lose certain frequencies within the audio. So one of the assignments I'm going to give you is to make recordings in different spaces that are av available to you so you can hear the balance between the sound that you're producing, the sound of the reflections that the room is causing, and the sounds of the background noises in the room. And you probably hear a consistent uh, hum in the background of my recordings because my computer has a loud fan. I use some noise reduction filters to, to get rid of that partially, uh, but it's always slightly present there. Since you'll be recording on a smartphone or an audio recorder, you won't need to have a computer there with you. So you can find an ideal space for recording and record there. Now, I'm not saying that all recordings need to be ideal or should be ideal or should hide the room they're made in. Sometimes it's very interesting to include the room that you're recording in, but learn how to make a clean recording where the room is invisible. Because the nice thing about that is then you can add any room to it using delay and reverberation. You can put your voice in a cave. You can put your voice in a cathedral. But if the room is included in the recording, it's harder to place that sound where you want it to be. It's sort of permanently locked in the place where it's recorded. So let's, let's look at an example of this. Here's a recording I made in a large live room. I'm going to open this file into Audacity. On Mac, you can do that by right-clicking the file and saying Open with Audacity. Um, another thing you can do is you can Command I, get information on the file, and you can specify that you want it to always open with Audacity. And in fact, you can say that you want all files of this type to open with Audacity by hitting 
change all. And it'll prompt you, are you sure you want to change? And you say continue. And now all files that end in the .m4a extension will open in Audacity. And you'll see that I've already done that if I look at this .aif file with command I. You'll see that .aif files are already set to open with Audacity. And the third way, of course, is to be in the Audacity software. And I can tell I'm in Audacity, even if there's no window open, because it says Audacity up here by the Apple, I can say File, Open, and just open the file. So here's a recording I made in a large live room. And in Audacity, I just click anywhere on the timeline to start playing, or I can click the green play button here. This is an example of a recording made in a large room with large flat parallel walls and background noise. And so what I do at this point in the recording is I raise my voice so that you can hear the effect of the acoustics of the room. You can hear the way my voice is being reflected around the room. You can hear the size and shape of the room as the sound is reflected off of the surfaces. And so that's made at the same distance, about four or five inches away from my mouth, slightly off axis on my smartphone. Um, so using the same distancing, I'm going to take a look at the small dead room. And here's a recording made in a more acoustically dead room with irregular soft objects like clothing and blankets and towels in it. And you can much less hear the size and shape of the room from the reflections because they're broken up by the soft objects in the room. Right, so that recording made in the dead room is much better for us to work with. First of all, it doesn't have the background noise. That large room I was in had like a consistent hum in it. And in this room, you can hear that the silence is actually pretty, pretty clean. There's a volume control here, so I could turn this up. And so I'm just gonna turn it up by about nine decibels, just so we can hear the quality of the silence in the room. There's always gonna be some sort of background noise in the room, but, uh, but you want it to be as, as minimal as possible. And also your recording device is always gonna inject some noise into the signal. This is inevitable. Sound recordings are never perfect. They're never totally airless. And in fact, they can sound quite unnatural if they are. So let's listen to the background noise in that large room. So I'm going to crank up my gain here. You want to be careful about doing this when you're wearing headphones because it can get quite loud. And we'll listen to that noise. See, that's a much more substantial noise or hum in that room. So that's just not a great recording room. And if you want that echoey quality like this, the size and shape of the room as the sound is reflected off of the surfaces, you can get that. You can create that in the software. And I'll show you that uh, just, it's not necessarily the most important thing to look at first, but it's it's kind of a fun thing to look at first. So we can go back into our small dead room. And I'm going to hit the select button here, which selects all of my sound. The other way you can select all of the sound is with command A. The third way you can select all of the sound is under the select menu, say select all. And you'll find this is a very typical thing in software. There's, in a good piece of software, there's always three ways to do the same thing. And it's good to know the three ways because that way you can use the one that you remember first. So we can go here under effect and we can add reverb. And reverb will simulate being in a larger room. So I click on reverb and it gives me some, some information here and I can preview to hear what that's gonna sound like. So, uh, and, and, and I won't go through what all of these settings are right now, um, but you can certainly play with them and see what they produce. And here's a recording made in a more acoustically... Right, so you can hear the space around that voice is being created by this reverberation effect. If I say wet only, this is gonna produce 
only the reflections, remove my original voice, and just let you hear this simulated room. And hear the recording made in a more acoustic way. And if I hit OK, it'll actually process this sound. Let's make this room even bigger just to be dramatic. Let's see what 86% is like. And here's a recording made in a more acoustically. And so if I hit OK, it will process the sound. And now when I play the sound back. And here's a recording made in a more acoustically dead room with irregular. And of course, what I'm saying doesn't now make sense with the sound of the room. But that's interesting. I've created a dissonance right, between the content of my words and the sound that we're actually hearing. Here's a more extreme example later on. Much less hear the size and shape of the room from the reflections. Because, right, but of course you can much more hear the size and shape of the virtual room or the imagined room that that sound is being made in. I can always undo the reverb and it will go back. But th uh, this is, audacity is what's called destructive sound editing, meaning when I process the sound, for instance, by adding a reverb or by adding some other effect. I am actually changing the sound file. And that is distinct from the way a lot of other audio editors work, like Ardor that we're gonna use later on in the semester, which is much more like Pro Tools, which perhaps you've heard of. That's a non-destructive audio editor in the sense that all the changes you make, all the effects that you add to the sound, all the editing you do, doesn't actually affect the original sound file. The software still references the original sound file and makes those changes to it in real time, whereas Audacity alters the original sound file. And these are, it's not one is better than the other. These are two different approaches to working with sound, and usually you'll use them in combination. All right, so let's look at how to do some basic starting maintenance on the recording. So very typically, one of the first things you do with a recording is a process called normalization. And normalization is scaling that sound's volume up to the digital maximum. What does that mean? Well, let's take the magnifying glass and zoom in on a piece of this sound to see what the sound actually is. I'll take the eye beam, select this thing that we just zoomed in on, and listen to it. Much less here. So that's me saying the words much less here. So let's zoom in even further. Let's just take the word much. Much. Zoom back in on that area of the sound. So you can see here that there's a rising and falling line. That's the waveform of the sound. That's the digital representation of how the molecules in the air are vibrating to create that sound. And that's captured by a microphone. Uh, and a microphone is actually a small wafer that vibrates in sympathy with the vibrations of the air molecules. So this is actually a graph of how that little wafer vibrated when the air that was vibrating hit it. And also, Interestingly, this is the shape in which a speaker cone needs to be shaken in order to revibrate the air and recreate the sound. So in a sense, this is a, is a map of how the speaker cone, which is a, essentially a piece of paper driven by an electromagnet, how the speaker cone is going to reproduce the sound. And these are represented in numbers. So if we go in even closer, we can see... This is a line that's undulating above and below zero. I'll zoom out a little bit and zoom in a more active part of the sound. Each of these little squares represents the instantaneous position of that microphone wafer when it was recording the sound or of the speaker cone as it's being shaken to reproduce the sound. And the range of these numbers is from negative one to one. So the most extreme positions that the microphone wafer can record are represented by values of one and values of negative one. And similarly, the most extreme position that the speaker can be pushed to are represented by one and negative one. And we can see that the loudest 
peaks of this sound are barely reaching 0.5 and negative 0.5. So what normalization is going to do is going to find the highest peak in the sound, figure out how much it needs to be turned up to fill the entire range from 1 to negative 1, and then scale everything so that the loudest sound actually uses the full amplitude range of the digital signal. We can use this tool to zoom back out to the entire sound, hit the select button to select all, go to effect, normalize, and watch what happens to the sound when we normalize. It's amplified so that the highest peak reaches either one or negative one, and that should be this sound right here. And so when we play this back, it's going to sound considerably louder. And here's a recording made in a more acoustically dead room. And so normalization is a typical first step, but let's look at another audio file where there's a problem with the normalization. Steve. Hello, this is Niav Conti, and I'm speaking to you from another dimension. If I take this file and attempt to normalize it, effect, normalize, OK, it actually gets quieter. Why is that? Because there's already, I'm going to edit, undo, normalize, there's already a sound that's too close to the digital maximum. Steve. Hello, this is Niav Conti. And she creates a sound that's too loud, so the normalization process actually backfires on us and makes the sound quieter. So we can go into this sound and actually edit it to remove the portion of the sound that's interfering with our normalization. Can take the I beam tool, can highlight that sound that I want to get rid of, and simply delete it. Now, sometimes this will create a little pop in the sound, but very often, if you just are cutting out a little piece of sound and not disturbing the background noise, it won't have a negative effect. Let's just play that section to hear. Hello. Hello. Yeah, no problem at all. So. We'll zoom back out to the full sound. And now, when we normalize, we should see the audio level increase rather than decrease. Effect. Normalize. OK. And there we go. Not very much, because this recording used nearly all of the range, but it did amplify it a little bit. So once you've normalized the sound, the next thing you want to do is do some noise reduction on it. Hello, this is Niav Conti, and I'm speaking to you from another dimension because you can hear that there's some underlying, significant underlying noise. And again, Audacity has a great feature for that. You highlight the noise and teach Audacity about the noise that it needs to reduce. So I highlight the noise. I go to Effect, Noise Reduction, and Get Noise Profile. This will teach Audacity about the noise we're trying to reduce. And then once you've done that, select all, say Effect, noise reduction again, and let's try a noise reduction of nine decibels. See what that does. Steve. Hello, this is Niav Conti, and I'm speaking to you from another dimension. This is a kind and loving dimension. It's very effective noise reduction. Here I'm going to undo so we can hear the difference. Dimension. This is a kind and loving dimension. And redo. Dimension. This is a kind and loving dimension. One. And notice the noise is not entirely gone. We could really do like a 12 or 15 dB noise reduction on this, but it would start to sound strange actually. Leaving a little bit of noise in the sound is, is not a bad thing. So then you want to be able to do some more editing on the sound to get it the way you want it. And we're going to look at more sophisticated ways to do that, but Audacity for simple sound editing is actually a great tool. Steve. Hello. This is so first of all, I want to cut myself out saying speed, so I'll just highlight that with the I-beam tool, hit delete, and I can zoom in with the plus tool. And typically, you're just going to want to add a little fade at the beginning. That's an effect. Fade in. And that will just fade up that noise floor. Hello, this is Niav Conti, and I'm... 
because anytime noise cuts in or out, it becomes more noticeable. But when it fades in and out, we don't really hear it in the same way. So let's see if there's anything else we want to do with this sound file. Hello, this is Niav Conti, and I'm speaking to you from another dimension. This is a kind and loving dimension, one where we're not all assholes. One okay. So there we can hear there's some kind of error in the sound. So we'll zoom in on that section of the sound where there's the problem. And using the eye beam, I can select an area, and then I can play it with the space bar or the play button. One where we're not all assholes. I can zoom in even further and try and visually see if I can find what might be the problem. If I zoom right in on where I'm hearing that problem, I see something here that looks like looks problematic to me. Right? Because typically our sound waveform keeps crossing the zero point in, in an oscillation. It goes up and then down and then up and then down and then up and then down. It's got this other little sound in it as well, but that's also up and down, up and down, up and down. And then here suddenly it does two ups above the zero. And so that to me looks like it could be our pop. The other thing that looks like a pop about this is if we zoom in even further, this line is straight up and down, which means that the speaker is changing positions very, very rapidly. So those things suggest to me that this may be the pop we want to get rid of. And we can try and delete it. We take the eye beam tool and select, select a section of sound, and we can just get rid of it. But there's two things I did here that are very important. Notice I started my selection on a zero crossing, where the sound is crossing the zero line. And I also ended my selection on a zero crossing. Because if I don't, I can get something like this, where I've just created this M shape, the same problem I just tried to delete. So start on a zero crossing, end on a zero crossing, and make sure you start on a descending zero crossing and end on a descending zero crossing. When I hit delete, I get a very natural looking transition in the waveform. It's going up to down, up to down, and that's the point where I cut it, but you can't see any cut there. There's no discontinuity, there's no speaker cone jump. Now, I'm not saying that will necessarily solve the problem, but let's zoom back out and see if it did. We're, we're not. And it did. There's still something a little odd about this. One where we're not. One where we're not. But there's, at least there's no more pop in there to draw the listener's attention to it. I want to show you one other way to solve the same problem. That's just another tool for you to have in your toolbox. So I'm going to undo the delete and put back that sound that was there. And I'm going to zoom back in on it. And there's my problem piece of sound. So I go edit clip boundaries, split, and that creates a slice or an edit in my audio. And around that, I can create a crossfade. So I can, for instance, click here, drag across to there, and this is the region that will be crossfaded. So this part to the left of my cut will be faded out while this part to the right is faded in, and the clips will be moved so that they overlap each other. This is a standard audio crossfade. One thing gets turned down while another thing gets turned up. So I'll say effect crossfade clips. And this should produce a very similar result that might be a little smoother or a little bit more to your liking. One where we're not. One where we're not. One where we're not. I feel like they're probably pretty equivalent. All right, so let's use this tool to zoom back out to our whole audio file, listen to the whole thing again, see if there's any more problems that we want to deal with. Hello, this is Niav Conti, and I'm speaking to you from another dimension. This is a kind and loving dimension, one where we're not all assholes, one where there's still hope for humanity. We'll see how long it lasts before they discover us and pervert it. Goodbye. So there don't seem to be any other real problems in the sound, but uh, we can, I, I, I don't think her pacing is great. 
uh, in part because this was improvised. She didn't know what she was going to say. And it's just a, it's just a microphone test. It's not actually, you know, something scripted or even intentional. Uh, so let's see if we can make this pacing flow a little more nicely. One where we're not all assholes. One where there's still hope for humanity. We'll see how long it lasts. So I feel like that pause is a little bit too long. I want, I want, I want, we'll see how long it lasts, come in just a little bit earlier. So use the same tool of deletion to alter the timing. And while we're at it, you see there's a little something there. There's a little maybe smacking noise. Uh, so I'm going to tighten up the timing and also get rid of that anomaly just by hitting delete. Still hope for humanity. We'll see how long it lasts. And because it's just background noise there, because the sound level is very low, I don't really have to worry about zero crossings because it's just the noise floor anyway. I'm not gonna create a big pop by doing that. So let's see how that timing worked out. One where there's still hope for humanity. We'll see how long it lasts. Right, you see the rhythm of that is much better. It, it just feels better. And you, you know, working with sound is a lot about feeling. What's too long, what's too short, make it feel right to you. Let's play the rest of it. We'll see how long it lasts before they discover us and pervert it. Goodbye. Okay, so there's a little mouth sound here at the end that I'm gonna just delete. Goodbye. And there's a little bit of noise when the recorder shuts off that I'll delete and then just do a little effect fade out at the end so that noise fades out gradually. And pervert it. Goodbye. Quite nice. So I'm pretty satisfied with that. We've got a good rhythm. We've removed the problematic parts. We've reduced the noise. We've normalized. We've faded at the beginning and the end. We can save this. So there's two ways to save in Audacity. If you just got a file save project, it will save a project file, which is not an audio file that you can play back. So say save project as, and it'll warn you, save project is from an Audacity project, not an audio file. For an audio file that will open in other apps, use export. And that's what I've done here. You can see I've saved Nyav New World project. And there's actually no real reason to save a project if you're dealing with only one track of audio. You don't need to do this. If we start using Audacity for multi-track applications, then saving the project becomes important. Um, but for right now, you don't need to save a project. And if you save an Audacity project, it will only reopen in Audacity. However, export is what you want to do. And for this class, we're primarily going to work with WAV files. WAV files are uncompressed, high quality audio files that open up in pretty much any application. And so we're going to do export as WAV. And then you want to make sure that you don't save over your raw audio file because I'm actually going to want you to submit both. And also you want to keep your raw audio files. If, if you make a change to a sound, because this is destructive audio editing, if you make a change to a sound that you're not happy with, you want to be able to go back to the original recording. So I say Nyav New World edited. And then often it's useful to put a date or a version number. So I could say edited 828v1, save that. Um, you can add metadata to the file, but it's not really necessary for a WAV file. It's important if you're exporting MP3 files that you're going to upload to some sort of service, but you can leave the metadata blank on these. And so these editing tools I gave you, they're just the very first simple basic editing tools, but you want to get very comfortable and familiar with these. So when you record your story, I want you to go in there, normalize it, noise reduce it, put some fades at the beginning and the end, and then really go through it and work it to remove any errors. And of course, if you stumble and or repeat a section, you'll want to choose the, the version that you like and keep that and delete the other. And, uh, and also edit for pacing so that things are paced the way that you want them to be. And uh, just for fun, this 
audio recording, which you know was just a mic check. It was nothing important, um, but I liked it a lot. I liked what she said a lot. So I uh, I made a meme piece of it, which is kind of taking the sample and setting it to music, which is something we're going to do as a project later on in this class. Not that you need to compose the music. You'll be able to download loops and uh, and remix the music rather than create it yourself if you're a non-musician. But the idea of taking a quote or a sound bite and setting it to music is is kind of a fun idea that's circulating a lot on the internet right now. And, um, and it's an interesting mode of storytelling in its own right. All right, so thanks. And uh, I look forward to receiving your work. And hit me up if you have any questions. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Hello, this is Niav Conti, and I'm speaking to you from another dimension. This is a kind and loving dimension. One where we're not all assholes. Discover us and pervert it.